Thank you so much. So, um, and you can let us know in the chat box if people are having issues or can't hear me or can't see my presentation. Um, so, thank you all for coming and thank anyone who uh, is joining now. Um, we're going to get started here in a few seconds, but I just want to um, uh, sort of explain why we're here and what we hope to accomplish. Um, so, Really, the motivation of this webinar is very similar to, say, a patient's first visit with me. Is I want I want to convey some basic um, elements of of how we approach things, what type of issues we commonly approach, what things um, um, you might worry about, and more importantly, most importantly, um, how to help you worry less about your neck and back. Um, what are the things that may alarm you, but um, have normal, um, typical spine explanations and, and treatment and expected outcomes. So we'll get through a bunch of that. Um, for those of you that um, haven't met us or been into the clinic, um, I'm, I'm Dr. Child. Um, I have a history with the institution in Lake Tahoe in general. I, I grew up here, came up here in 73 and um, went to high school here, left for about 25 years, and now I've been back a total of six and a half years um, after spending time in um, some pretty great places. Um, I trained orthopedics in New Mexico, um, did a pair of fellowships, one um, in Boston in the Harvard system and another um, under the University of Washington at Harvard View Medical Center and um, started out my career focusing on academic spine surgery, um, which is the more complex end of what's done out there. And at some point, um, family brought me home. And so I'm here and I've been here now six and a half years, um, asked to take the baton from Mike Fry, who has been your community spine surgeon for the last 30 plus years. And, uh, and is just a really dear friend of mine. So um, hopefully I'll do him some justice and communicate some good information to you. And, you know, I honestly hope I um, forestall some visits more than I encourage visits to come see us because um, I'd like to um, reassure patients more than um, get y'all worked up about stuff that's pretty typical. Um, so to that end, let's get started. Um, you know, we want to talk about some uh, of the spine anatomy because a lot of this stuff um, should um, and actually is Latin. So um, it, it doesn't just sound like that. Um, and I want to describe some of the common pain um, generators, things that cause people low back and neck pain um, and and make that more intelligible for you guys. Also, um, what to look out for, what are some actual red flags and probably merit attention sooner than later. Um, so, you know, I have, um, and if anyone has seen me, they understand one thing that um, it's, it's, it's more than just um, a disclaimer to nearly all my patients. Um, I have one rule for treatment. I have one rule for um, uh, what tests I order and what surgery I perform, and, and that's um, what would I do for me? What would I do, more importantly, for my wife, my mother, or my child, children, um, which is a good point. If you hear children screaming in the other room, we're doing this webinar from my house. Um, so, yeah, that's actual children screaming. Um, so, so, what we really want for you know, again, my family or you, my extended family, is that we want to have good information. Um, we want to base all our information on good data, not just make assumptions. Um, and then reserve surgical care for those people who not only have a good story to tell, they have a problem with all the data that we think is necessary to make a good decision. They have a good plan, which should lead to a good outcome. And then They've exhausted all the easy stuff prior to surgery. So, um, you know, never should um, it be the other way around. 
Um, surgery is never or rarely my first option, unless there are these rare exceptions where people have a problem that needs immediate attention. Um, it's always going to be the option of last resort, the last stop on the train, um, the time when we feel like we've exhausted conservative care and surgery makes the most sense. Um, so um, we get um, tasked quite often, as you might imagine, with low back pain. And let's, let's make low back and neck pain fairly synonymous because um, spine pain in general is really common. Um, basically all of us will have neck or back pain. Um, it's um, the number one uh, workplace disability. Um, uh, out of all the reasons people go to the doctor, it's number five. Um, and I think the stat I pulled from a paper was 80%. I think if you're of that 20%, um, you're really lucky because to my knowledge, I have nothing going on with my spine and I've had at least four or five severe low back episodes um, in my life, my adult life. And, and each one was disabling, horrible, severe and um, terrible. And yet was self-limited and I went back to work and everything um, is smooth. So, um, and, and I know for a fact that my imaging and my um, spine's pretty darn good um, so far that I hurl towards aging. Um, one of the most common things that I get asked, and I think this is completely legitimate, is, um, you know, was this me? Um, we live in a place where people do a lot of crazy stuff. Um, I did a lot of crazy stuff. And the assumption is that those are the things that lead to spine problems. Um, and, and certainly that's true. If we look at data, we know that power lifters, football players, um, you know, people who are more sedentary and carry more weight do have more issues than people who don't. But far and above the most common um, uh, uh, indicator for all of this, and I'll cut ahead, is heredity. You know, your, your parents, if you want to blame anyone, they're the, probably the best target. Um, our backs look a lot like our parents. And um, so you can do all the above or you can do none of the above. And um, Dana Randall, who's um, also logged on tonight, uh, will attest that we probably operate on as many secretaries, medical assistants, um, librarians, um, as we do mixed martial artists and weightlifters and uh, former athletes. Um, unfortunately, or or not, we're all entitled to back issues and, and probably um, the most common denominator is, is uh, who we are and what we're destined to have as a spine. Um, so uh, nonetheless, um, being in good conditioning, being healthy, if nothing else adds quality of life, adjusted years um, to you and your health, and if it helps prevent back problems, great. Of course, unless you do have a twin, um, we'll be hard pressed to say that um, you would avoid or encourage back problems by doing any of the above or none of the above. So the point of this slide and, and what I am routinely encouraging patients to do is don't blame yourself as much as have a good active, healthy life and um, know that your spine is a destiny and we're here to help you through whatever that destiny is. Um, one of the issues of low back and neck pain is that, um, as we just said, it's really common, yet um, pinning it down can be often very hard. There's multiple pain generators. You know, here's a list of eight or 10. Um, I could rattle off another 20 uh, without even blinking. It's common, there's lots of pain generators, there's lots of potential issues that can have pain. And um, the problem is, is that, you know, I can't tell you necessarily, and, and there are exceptions, but I can't tell you always whether it's the vertebral body, the inner vertebral disc, the nerve, the muscles, the ligaments, the tendons, 
um, all of the above working together. These are all things that are potential pain generators. And um, what we do is instead <coughs> exclude some of the dangerous things, the red flags. Um, um, and then we'll um, develop a treatment plan that treats most of these, maybe not all of these, and helps most people. Um, if you look at what diagnoses we do make, most of them fall in this, I guess you'd call it a wastebasket diagnosis of lumbar strain or sprain. Um, that means something with the ligaments, the muscles, the tendons, maybe the nerves to those muscles, ligaments, or tendons. Um, Maybe. Um, we certainly see a lot of degenerative disc disease or um, degeneration of the facets, which by any other name is arthritis. You get arthritis in your spine, just like you get it in the knees and hips and ankles and wrists. And um, in the spine, we call it degenerative disc disease, but at its heart, it's really the same stuff. Um, it's it's us wearing out the normal lifespan of our um, discs, our joints, and, um, and that has consequences. Um, we can have real things like, um, I, uh, I shouldn't say real things, but um, traumatic things happen to us. Um, we can have actual injuries or trauma. We can have um, osteoporotic injuries or trauma. You know, people have, come to my clinic having fractured vertebrae from coffee because their bone is weak. And again, that's sort of their destiny. Um, osteoporosis is a common um, cause of vertebral insufficiency fractures. And, and it's fairly widespread, especially among fair-skinned, thin um, Europeans. Um, uh, Spinal stenosis is another common problem. We'll get into some of these things, which you'll have trouble pronouncing, like spondylolisthesis um, and some other stuff. But the vast majority of these problems are really just mechanical spinal issues. And you may or may not know what set them off. Um, and common complaints in my clinic are picking up the keys, picking up the kids, picking up a 300 pound barbell and deadlifting it. You know, these are all possibilities, but um, they're all basically mechanical issues. You strain, sprain, pull something, um, stress the system, or, or it just acts up. Non-mechanical spinal conditions like um, more sinister things, cancer, disease, um, infection, um, those are all very rare. Make up, you know, just about 1% of all spinal conditions that'll come to our clinic. And so you should be reassured that in all likelihood for non-specific neck or back pain, you're probably coming with a mechanical problem that should be very reassuring. Nothing sinister is going on. Um, and there are some imitators, you know, there are, um, pancreas, kidneys, um, uh, bowel disorders, all uh, pelvic disorders, which can all simulate back pain um, um, or neck pain. And we have some ways to sort through those and sometimes they're just tricked. So what do we do about this? Um, like I said, many times we can't put our finger on exactly what your spinal problem or condition is. So um, first thing we do is we reassure you guys, um, letting you know that in general, um, most people get good relief out of good conservative care. Um, and um, try and de-escalate, you know, some of your pain and anxiety over the situation, because I know I've been there and I've had it. Um, there are things we can do to make your um, pain better and course shorter. Um, and we'll, we'll circle back around to that. Um, and then we make sure that we not only implement a plan, but follow up with it. Um, we don't just want to reassure you it's nothing and push you out the door. We want to engage you with good 
um, evidence-based conservative care and then follow up to make sure it's working. Uh, one might wonder how do we catch some of these rare one percenter type problems and, and it's with good diligent follow-up to make sure that you know problems that are typical typically go away and problems that aren't um, the more we try and treat them and engage with them they tend to uh, stick around be in our face and um, and need uh, or demand further attention um, we won't always get an x-ray uh, although many times my bias is if it was bad enough to come to the spine surgeons clinic and you don't have recent x-rays we'll get them um, so don't be surprised if we do and don't necessarily be surprised if we don't depending on your problem um so time's a, a, a big issue um i think many times i'll see patients who come into clinic with months or um, years or decades of a problem and um i think you can look at that a few ways i'm saddened to hear that somebody might have been suffering for years or decades um, but i'm also encouraged that that is not a difficult or um, sinister problem because anything that's really bad or a real threat to you doesn't go on that long without causing a real problem. So in all likelihood, that's reassuring. Um, everyone in our healthcare system will tell you that every day, practically in this system or any system, people will report to the emergency room, sometimes on stretchers with, via ambulance. And um, quite honestly, you can't even breathe near them without setting off their pain because they're, they're in a really bad way with um, severe under emitting terrible spasm. Um, and, and again, in a perverse way, that's sort of reassuring to me because most of that, the vast majority of that is benign and terrible. Um, I certainly understand uh, the magnitude of a non-sinister benign problem and how it can cause you terrible, awful, and remitting pain. Um, we do have this regimen um, of conservative care, which will focus on mobilization, physical therapy, um, also non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which are low risk. They block inflammation in a chemical pathway in the body, keep it blocked for one to three weeks and then inflammation calms down or we might go for something stronger like steroids which are more powerful anti-inflammatory but same mechanism basically um we have some medications um people have heard of medications like gabapentin um pregabalin lyrica neurontin um, and these are nerve calming medications those can be employed and even antidepressants which share a similar chemical structure as the gabapentins and the pregabalins. Um, so they work to calm nerves and also have an antidepressant quality, usually prescribed at a different dose for depression, but when prescribed for nerve or back um, pain, um, are really targeting the excitability of a nerve, not, uh, not that people think um, it's your anxiety or your depression that's at play. Um, narcotics need to be talked about because um, A, there's some unrealistic expectations out there and B, there's some um, very specific laws regarding them. Um, but if you take a step back and just look at the pure science of opioid pain medications for um, neck or back pain, it's terrible. Um, and if you look at patients two and four years out, um, two groups who are randomized to either receive opioid pain medications or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, um, what you'll find at two and at four years even is that both groups will endorse pain and both groups will probably rate it at the same level. So let's say six out of 10 on a 10 scale. Um, the big difference is the opioid group deals with all the chronic complications of opioids and um, certainly, you know, numerous other things and risks that, that we won't go into today, but the end result is their pain honestly isn't much different, which is hard to reconcile if somebody prescribes them to you and you'll get a short-term benefit to it. But what we're really talking about is chronic pain without um, a known endpoint. 
I mentioned laws in place because understand that since 2018, um, most states, but especially California and Nevada, have really made it clear that the only people who should be prescribing opioids for neck or back pain are primary care physicians, uh, board certified pain management physicians, and surgeons for up to 12 weeks after a surgery. So my role in pain management or prescribing opioids is after surgery. Um, and I suppose that's as it should be because these medications carry a lot of extra baggage and you want, um, you want me to control your surgical pain and you want somebody who really knows um, the ins and outs of when these medications are indicated for chronic pain to be managing that ship. Um, so now we're gonna go through a few problems where surgical referrals and surgery is indicated. Um, so why might your primary care send you to me? Um, and the first good answer, honestly, I'm gonna back up from that is whenever they think it's indicated, I am more than happy to see somebody and gladly tell them that this isn't a surgical problem and that we have a good plan that's non-surgically based and um, good conservative care um, and send you back um, or follow you for that. Um, I am I am actually more happy with that outcome than if you're suffering so bad where um, surgery is indicated. But common surgical issues, acknowledging that this is usually the last stop on our train, is um, sciatica type problems. So whether it's cervical radiculopathy, so I promise there'd be some Latin, um, Radic is Latin for root. Radiculopathy isn't because it's just ridiculous. It's because it radiates down um, the path of the nerve, um, whether it's the nerve that goes down um, part of your arm or part of your leg. Um, it's all the same phenomenon. In fact, sciatica um, is very nonspecific. The sciatic nerve is one of four nerves, technically five, and um, and it can be either of those nerves. And um, so when somebody says sciatica to me, I will have to drill down and say, well, what are we talking about? Are we talking about your anterior thigh? Are we talking about your lateral thigh, your posterior thigh or buttock? Um, those are all branches of the sciatic nerve and each one can be affected individually, sometimes together. Um, so, um, Burning, searing, radiating arm pain is a common reason you're sent to me um, and Dana. Um, these other things we'll talk about, and, and I'm going to skip by them right now, but basically, catacoin is a serious thing. I'll explain that. Um, motor weakness, you actually can't use your muscles or lift your foot or raise your glass because of muscles are weak. That's a good reason to see me urgently. Um, and um, all the above mixed together. So um, this is what I'm getting at is um, some of the nerves in the neck will have characteristic distributions. Pain, a, a C5 nerve, which is usually between the C4 and 5 bone might radiate to your shoulder. Or um, the C6 um, nerve might radiate out um, into your thumb and index finger and can make you weak in um, wrist extension or biceps. Um, these are all tools which we have to figure out where the pain's coming from before we rely on MRIs or other advanced um, steps. Um, and in the, the um, low back and neck, another common problem is spinal stenosis. Um, and the symptoms of spinal stenosis are um, pain, which is usually activity related, especially with upright activities. Um, in the low back, it's most commonly associated with an inability to walk distances. I have patients who can gauge their spinal stenosis by how far they can walk, whether it's a mile, a block, or to the end of my clinic hallway before they have to sit down and get some relief. Um, another one's called spondylolisthesis and we'll come back to that. Um, what is stenosis? And that's um, something that is initially a little hard to wrap your head around, but stenosis of anything is just narrowing. 
um, if it's stenosis of the pipes in your house, it's that that normal pipe, which should be wide open, is now narrowed because of you know, that stuff, whatever it is, um, calcification, mineralization. Um, in um, your coronary arteries, spinal sten or stenosis, um, in this case, coronary artery stenosis can um, narrow the caliber of your coronary arteries, which you guess it's a really bad problem, um, especially in those two arteries. You don't want that. Um, and thank God there are people who can treat that. Um, you can have stenosis of uh, your ureter, bladder, um, or urethra. So quite a few people, um, uh, men over the age of, well, let's say 60, because I'm not there yet, um, can get stenosis of um, the genital urinary tract because of the prostate. That is stenosis at, at the base of it. Um, and then of course, what I concern myself with in my day job is spinal stenosis. And um, I will ask everyone to sort of join me on a little bit of, um, of a educational tour. What you're looking at here is uh, a cervical MRI. So this is the back of somebody's neck. This is their face up in front. This white stuff up here is spinal fluid, which is surrounding the brain stem and the spinal cord, which is this dark line that goes down the center here. The spine proper is these bones in front here and the discs in between them. Um, and then that makes a bony arch that surrounds the spinal cord and protects it. But um, when things like disc herniations or arthritis intrude in that space, you can have pressure on the nerves or spinal cord in this case. Um, we'll come back to a very similar looking image when we talk about um, compression of the spinal cord, but you can have stenosis on the spinal cord on individual nerves um, in multiple locations. When it's in the spinal cord level, that's a condition called myelopathy. And this is one of those things I like patients to look out for. Um, it is a common um, problem. Um, most people have some congenital or underlying predisposition to it. They have a normal canal or a narrowed canal to begin with. It's a little less than the normal size. So in those patients, a little bit of intrusion by a disc or um, uh, ligaments or arthritis can go a long ways and they can have this pressure on the spinal cord. And what it results in is essentially a spinal cord injury. Not the kind where um, you fall off the top of your roof and are paraplegic or quadriplegic, um, can't move your arms or your legs. This is the type of problem that starts by loss of your fine motor skills. You used to build ships and bottles, do um, detailed work, um, fine knitting, and now you can't. Your hands don't work as well. Sometimes even people can't button their buttons. And that's usually associated with some instability in their gait. Uh, people can't walk um, with stability. They're prone to falls. Sometimes or frequently in clinic, I hear, I feel like I'm drunk walking, but I'm not drinking. Um, and then some of these other symptoms, which um, are more for me and um, maybe um, providers I give this talk to. Um, but basically those two big things, loss of or fine motor skills and instability when you walk, they're symptoms of chronic spinal cord injury. And that is something that has to be stopped um, and is usually a surgical um, problem. Otherwise, this tends to get worse and progressively worse and surgery may not um, return that function. Um, it's really designed to stop it where it's at so it doesn't get worse. Um, another common problem um, that I, as we now shift into sort of some of these things I want you guys to know about is, is the sequela or problems associated with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and thankfully, we're seeing a lot less of this. Um, quite honestly, rheumatoid arthritis medications and treatment with them are pretty darn good. So much so that if you're an actively treated um, rheumatoid arthritis patient by a rheumatologist, you're really quite unlikely to have these problems. Um, it's not a guarantee. 
Um, and yet many patients don't know they have it. And frequently, I'd say at least, you know, a couple times a year, I'm making a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis because of somebody's neck problem. Um, and then sending them to rheumatology because nobody's caught it yet. And um, ignore all the big fancy words, but essentially there's a host of problems in the neck that can happen. And they all lead to some of these um, myelopathy-like problems that involve function or pain and instability in the neck. So the take-home message from this slide is that if you have or have loved ones who have rheumatoid arthritis is to a, talk about it with your doctor um, and stay on top of your symptoms and your treatment because most of this can be avoided, but it's a common surgical problem that I encounter when it's left neglected. Spondylolisthesis, and, and um, uh, this is a webinar, there's no tests. Um, so I won't ask you to pronounce that or um, define it, but, but the easiest way to think of this common problem is, is a slippage of one vertebrae on another, and it can happen in either the neck or the low back. Um, it's actually most common in a form that happens during adolescence. It's a stress fracture in the posterior part of the spine, which allows the anterior spine to slip away from the posterior part. Um, and that's more common in adolescents who are really active, who do um, hyperextension type sports. So gymnasts, football players, um, volleyball, anything where they're repetitively flexing, extending um, can be susceptible and overall 6% of adolescents can get it. Um, most of this has gone undiagnosed. They might have an episode of back pain, which is self-limited and felt to be related to growing pains and it won't show up on an x-ray unless you're really looking for it um and so a i encourage you know parents of adolescents if they complain of chronic back pain you know more than a day or a couple days um no more than a week to consider or at least um, bring it up to the primary care pediatrician and um it really persists weeks to months that's not typical of uh, an adolescent experience and, and I'm more than happy to see them and rule out these problems. Um, now, when it is more commonly encountered is in the fourth, fifth or sixth decade where patients um, start to present with the problems associated with it. And that problem brings us back to one of our other topics is that with that slippage, the nerves can get pinched and it really leads to small stenosis by another form. And so again, can lead to pressure on the nerves or sciatica can um, cause pain radiating down the arms or legs. And so um, it's a common problem. Um, um, speaking of uh, genetics, I'm probably prone to this because I think both of my parents have a spondylolisthesis um, of some degree and um, neither have had spine surgery, so that's good news. If after um, all said and done, you have this problem and you have um, exhausted conservative care and suffer from it. The good news is that this has rather good surgical outcomes. Um, and uh, we can make that unstable spine stable and we can um, make that nerve pain in almost all cases go away. So um, that's a good thing. Um, we won't talk about pediatric deformity um, other than um, it's fairly common. Two to 4% of adolescents can have some version of a scoliosis and we still don't know what the instigator of scoliosis is. Um, I previously did a lot of this, now I do very little because quite honestly, um, this is one of those things that um, is best um, treated at least surgically um, in institutions where they do a lot of it. And um, in my previous post, we had all this sent to us. And now I think we will gladly manage patients through this, make sure that they don't have anything that's any threat to them and treat them up until the point where I feel that maybe we should have these surgical discussions and then decide where they're best suited. Um, 
this is a high wire in my mind, not because this is real, a real threat to the patient. In fact, it rarely is. Uh, I can't think of a non-surgical scoliosis patient of the typical varieties that had any catastrophic thing happen to them outside of surgery. Um, and so we want to we want to practice good, conservative, thoughtful care like we would for our own children um, to make sure that um, we approach this in the right way. Adult spinal deformity, however, is really common. Um, and, um, you know, my common spiel in clinic is that, you know, practically all of us will have some deformity of our spines as we age, provided we're lucky enough to age. Um, and the longer we age, that likelihood increases. Quite honestly, we didn't used to deal with this problem. Um, the farther back you go, either, oh, pestilence, war, um, warring tribes, saber-toothed tigers, you name it, took us out before our spine really um, got a chance to have a deformity or se severe arthritis or degeneration. Now that's not the case. And sometimes our, our activities and our good health are outliving our spines. And, and that's where we come in. Um, there's been a whole lot of uh, scientific research and data on um, adult spinal deformity um, is the focus or was the focus of my practice for the first five years of my career and, and now I would say make probably 60% of it um, even here in Lake Um The key things about this are to again like kids be thoughtful, judicious, conservative whenever possible. Um, also from the patient's point of view you want to um, see and be evaluated by people who, who deal with this a lot. Not all spine surgeons are comfortable with um, dealing with um, higher mag deformity. And so they'll guide you towards places, centers like me or some of the universities around uh, the region. Um, fortunately, since we've come here, we haven't really had to downgrade our care. Uh, from a university level in any respect with um, adult spinal deformity because we're able to more or less do the same things as we did at a university um, here because we've built a team, we've built those resources. Um, and that's probably unique for the area because um, I don't think we have a lot of um, people who want to take this stuff on. So um, we're happy to, and, and these are nuanced discussions we're happy to have with individual patients. Um, and sometimes lead to pretty dramatic intervention. Um, and I don't want to um, honestly get into that in too much detail because um, there's a whole spectrum of problems and not everything is, you know, a high grade degenerative scoliosis like this, which needs a, a long lumbopelvic fusion. Um, actually, very few do. Um, there's sort of a spectrum of problems which can result from really mild disease um, uh, to, you know, significant, sometimes even iatrogenic disease that's caused by um, interventions that patients have had in the past. Um, and can ultimately, um, or not ultimately, but we can even see patients with even more severe deformities. Um, but as one might guess, these all need to be treated very differently and um, with different um, uh, demands on the patient, the surgeon, and the system. So um, it's another good point as you're discussing your problems um, with friends, relatives, and people who've had spine surgery is that it really does become, as you can see from that sequence of x-rays, apples and oranges. Um, and you know, you could be comparing an apple with an orange um, in the person sitting next to you um, who's had what seems like a similar spine surgery to the one you might be contemplating. Um, so, um, just briefly about uh, osteoporosis and insufficiency fractures. Um, they're common. Um, 
and um, I would say rarely need intervention. Not, rarely require intervention. Um, we see patients routinely for osteoporotic insufficiency fractures. And um, I would say the number that actually need an intervention is probably in the five to 15% range because the good news is, is that most of these bones um, heal just like nature intended it. Um, uh, I had a good friend in spine surgery who did a lot of research out of one of the large um, human specimen libraries in um, Chicago. And you're hard pressed to find a human skeleton with an unhealed pressure fracture. They all heal. Um, the problem is, is that some patients um, continue to have pain and instability for much longer than honestly they'd like to tolerate. And so in those instances, if they don't follow a normal um, progression of healing, they aren't treated easily in a brace and get good relief from good conservative care, then that can be an option for them. I told you we'd come back to Kata Aquina because um, you have to know about it. Um, it's rare. So how often are we called to uh, operate on this in the middle of the night or um, unexpectedly um, every year? A handful of times. Um, and that's because what Cotaquina syndrome represents is a complete blockage of all the neural impulses below whatever is causing the problem. In this case, on your screen, you have a large disc herniation down here at the bottom of the spine for anyone who's really um, interested, that's L5S1. And the problem is, is that everything below this or what that's compressing are the sacral nerve roots. And those are the nerve roots that um, innervate your bladder um, and your bowel function. So, um, and this is the take home message, should you have sudden loss of bowel or bladder function or weakness, you can't um, actually lift your foot up, depress it. Um, that's a surgical emergency. You should go to the emergency room and get it evaluated because um, that can lead um, to permanent disability. If in 48 hours they don't get um, good intervention to take the pressure off that, you could be permanently um, without bowel bladder function. Um, not a life-threatening emergency, but that's a pretty big deal. And um, and it's and it's just a um, a huge issue institutionally and financially, both for the patient and for the system. This is the number one thing doctors are. Uh, or uh, spine surgeons are sued over. Um, and I think uh, fairly some of those patients are missed, not enough um, attention was paid to their symptoms. But I would say most of it is just because the outcomes are so terrible that um, people want, um, want some responsibility here. Um, we live in Tahoe, and I presume we have a lot of active people um, listening and in, uh, involved in this webinar. So trauma is, um, or injuries to the spine are um, pretty common here. Um, I can't tell you how many times I jumped off um, the cliffs at Angora, and all I can tell um, you is that I'm, I'm unlucky, and all of us who grew up here are, because for to six times a summer, um, I'm fixing somebody's spine for having jumped off one of those cliffs and pulverized their spine. Um, and, um, you know, if uh, of privacy were present, I'd love to show you some just amazing videos that patients have taken of their injuries because they're not all so dramatic. Um, I had a patient we fixed last year who was sledding with his grandchildren, um, decided to take the sled, and he was 69, um, went off about a three-inch jump, um, was no more than three inches in the air and landed and needed that surgery there. Um, so how do you prevent that? I don't know, um, other than it's common, and we do deal with that here. Um, um, and I wish I had some good preventative measures other than um, sanity that helps. 
um, if you think it's too dangerous and could lead to uh, a spine injury, then you're probably right and recommend avoiding it. Um, occasionally, we have to think outside the back um, and um, we are routinely referred problems that are felt to be the spine and yet um, we might end up making a referral to the hip or knee surgeon um, or to um, an obstetrician gynecologist or internal medicine doc. Um, rarely is it something like this, which is a mass um, uh, in the colon and, um, and it's sinister. Um, but I would say the vast majority aren't that. It's just that there are a lot of things that can cause pain that is felt to be the spine. And um, there's not a whole lot of education I can um, give on that because it's one of the nuances that even we struggle with. But we do um, open up our radar whenever necessary, when things don't fit the pattern, when our workups and our treatments and our follow-up don't um, illuminate the problem then sometimes we are led into um, uh, problems that we didn't expect. Um, and that's the other um, topic that I wanted to cover is um, the terrible of the typical or terrible is when should you be concerned? When should you um, worry that, hey, this is scaring me um, or should scare me or I should seek attention earlier rather than later or go to the emergency room, God forbid. Um, <clears throat> some of those things um, are um, intuitive and others not. Um, you know, age, like I mentioned, you know, adolescents generally don't have neck or back problems. Some of them do and some most of them are benign. But if they persist, they really should be worked up. Um, age is a pretty good discriminator. Um, if somebody comes in complaining of severe unremitting back pain for a week and they're 75, um, I'm much more likely to find degenerative reasons for that. Whereas if they're 10, I've raised at least a red flag that I need to follow through with. Other um, problems are if you have a strong either family history or a personal history of cancer, then um, sooner than later, I think it's reasonable to see somebody work it up and exclude that it's not that thing. Because um, I love to give reassurance to people who you know, maybe have a real serious history, maybe have been treated um, and had good results, but are terrified of the possibility that their cancer could have returned or gone to their spine. And I'm uh, more than happy to dive into it, reassure them that it hasn't and rarely um, deal with it when it has. Um, some other clues to especially malignancy or infection are things like constitutional symptoms. Back pain that's sudden onset with fevers and chills shouldn't really happen um, unless the two are just coincidental. Um, obviously, when we get things like the flu, we can have muscle aches and back aches. Um, but severe back pain and fevers um, of no other origin need to be chased down. Um, same thing with unexplained weight loss. Weight gain, unfortunately, is generally not associated with any obvious um, sinister problems, yet um, unexplained weight loss can be. Um, so 20 pound weight loss without trauma um, and back pain, um, that really raises that flag. Um, other things, I bring up non-lumbar because certainly the thoracic spine with the rib cage is less commonly involved. Uh, it's about 1% of our problems, but still probably about 10% of our patients that we work up. And most, 99% of that is benign and um, doesn't need any attention. Um, and the scoliosis, again, like all scoliosis should be worked up. There are some unique variants of it. When we see, we'll get excited about it. Um, in general, um, it should just be evaluated and then we can reassure parents or patients as to why they have it. Of those people that are referred to us um, for bad problems, um, this is again the red flag list, um, most of them present with back pain and some combination of something else like pain and weakness, back pain and um, a mass um, or these other symptoms. Um, 
and typically this is a back pain um, that is different. Um, the best way to describe it is by thinking of what might be going on. So in the case of somebody who might have sinister back pain from let's say cancer, remember that that cancer is there, it's always there. Um, as it's growing, it doesn't take breaks when you rest. It doesn't um, ease up when you sleep or when you um, are in the shower, or putting hot water in or in the hot tub. It's always there. And that unexplainable, chronic, enduring, nothing changes it um, type back pain should be chased down. Um, and again, most of it's been a mind. Most of it isn't a problem. But, um, but that's more typical than that. I wanted to use this opportunity to, to talk a little bit about um, what's out there because um, understand uh, in my heart of hearts, I'm a minimally invasive surgeon. Um, everything I do is the most invasive surgery possible, yet we live in um, uh, a era where it's also a very marketable concept. And, and so um, I'm also routinely involved in um, other people's injuries, other people's um, errors in judgment. And, um, and I think the short um, disclaimer is, if you think it's too good to be true, you have terrible unremitting pain and, um, and somebody is offering you a new cutting edge treat that is really minimally invasive, at least vet it with another surgeon, get a second opinion, um, even if it's mine. Um, uh, because um, sometimes if it's to be true, it is. Um, and if you look on the internet, do a quick Google search, uh, minimally invasive is everywhere. Um, and we do it, we do all of it. Um, yet, um, it has to be said, um, what we do and what we take pride in is good surgery, regardless of the size of the incision, whether it's um, half a centimeter smaller or half a centimeter larger, um, it really needs um, to address the problem. Laser Spine Institute, um, coincidentally, rarely did laser surgery and um, also not too coincidentally, it's out of business. Um, and there's a lot of money to be made. So whether it's um, some of our legacy patients from Mike Fry's tenure, um, who, again, I can't say enough good things about. Mike is a, just a wonderful human being, an excellent surgeon and a good friend, um, and has served this community for 30 years. Uh, truly um, uh, with the patient's best interests at heart. Um, or um, whether you see Dana, uh, who is um, a week old member of the spine team, Dana's there to help you get through these episodes. She's here to um, get the ball rolling for patients who might end up with me, because quite honestly, um, there's a whole lot between um, your initial evaluation and when or if I have to have that surgical consultation with somebody. Um, and Dana um, gets you there quicker than anyone. Um, or whether you have to see me and um, that may come uh, early in the process or late, hopefully early. Um, and um, I think the take home message is we're all here for you. We all wanna do um, what's right for you like we would do for our family. Um, and um, fortunately for a lecture like this, more than anything else, we'll probably end up um, instituting some good conservative things, um, getting you good relief without um, unnecessary interventions. And, and if it comes to it, um, we do all that. And so we're happy to take you through that and, um, and get you where you need to go as well. So with that, um, I think we're gonna um, open up the floor for questions and I'm sure I've stirred the pot a little bit. Um, Natasha, can you bring up the yes. chat room? Thank you so much, Dr. Child. Um, just as a reminder, if you have questions, you can ask them in either the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen or um, in the um, chat box. And so we have a couple I'll get started on. And yeah, there you are again. Okay. Um, so <coughs> 
question is what should someone do if they get the weakness and the sawing pain in the upper arm or bilateral numbness in both arms, but it's sporadic, always getting headaches. Is it worth setting an appointment to see if you can figure out um, that person's problem? Yeah, so um, a big distinction we always like to make um, and, and frequently have to make is, is again, between um, just what we call axial neck pain and back pain, which are essentially straight down the spine, or radiating pain. And remember, radiating pain, whether it's numbness or tingling, or whether it's severe hot electric knife flamethrower pain, um, all descriptions I routinely hear, that's generally nerve pain. Um, and even though it's terrible, um, it's awful. People who haven't had nerve pain honestly can't um, can't empathize adequately to it because it's it's um, it's as bad as it gets. And I've I had many patients look me straight in the eye and say, "If you have to take the arm off, do it. Just please take this pain away." So the good news is that most patients who have sporadic <coughs> Occasional numbness, tingling, or um, even radiating arm pain that goes away. Um, I'm a more than happy to um, first institute some of the good conservative stuff, um, which generally entails physical therapy, um, some modalities like traction. Um, I'm routinely asked whether chiropractors or acupuncture are good choices, and and I think they are. Um, they, if you look at the scientific literature, are called pain. Um, they somewhere um, just below physical therapy, um, and but do have good data in the literature, and we'll send you to them, um, especially when we think you know that's really a, a good fit for you. But I have um, a, a motto that these non traditional modalities, which include, and I shouldn't say that non traditional is the wrong word, but um. Uh, let's say uh, multimodal um, aspects of care like chiropractor, acupuncture, myofascial therapy, and some of the stuff that has very little data um, that's out there. And maybe now I won't start naming names, but, but the moral is, is that if it makes you better, not worse, doesn't break the bank, um, and, and it passes the sniff test of they're not doing crazy stuff with you um, that you think might be dangerous. Um, I'm all for it if it makes you better. Um, and we will routinely recommend it if we think it'll help you. Um, but for the person who has sporadic numbness and tingling or pain, I would tell them, you know, if it's for a day, give it a, give it a um, couple more because most of this will come and go and you don't have to see me and you don't have to, um, to worry about it. Um, a common modality that I might recommend to people is a short course of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. As long as I've checked their medical history for ulcers or bleeding problems, I'll tell them to try a week or two um, of ibuprofen or a leave and see how that benefits them. And if it does, maybe that's all they needed. Um, and again, circling back to the red flags, if that intermittent sporadic pain becomes actual weak, that you can lift your arm, you can't pick something up, you can't lift your foot up or dragging your foot, slapping on the ground because it doesn't have that ability to hold it off the ground. Um, those are reasons to see us sooner than later um, and get a more urgent referral because that's a nerve problem that's actually affecting the muscle and, and we don't want that to be a permanent problem. Great. Uh, the next question is about the, what's the latest research on disc replacement surgery and what are your thoughts on it? Great question. Um, we do a lot of disc replacements and um, uh, there's a few caveats. So the cervical artificial disc has now um, great literature for single levels going on 15 years and for two levels, which is all it's FDA approved for going on eight to 10 years. And that data is starting to trend towards superiority to some of our older treatments like effusion. Now, that's not true because in all patients because um, I just saw somebody um, two days ago who, who really uh, came to me for a cervical artificial disc. And um, after getting a CT scan on them and, and seeing how much arthritis they had on their neck, um, 
you know, I, I honestly told them a fusion was a better surgery for them because they had severe tightness. They needed a surgery. But if you imagine a very arthritic spinal level um, and now making that more mobile by putting an artificial disc in, you can actually exacerbate people's pain. So now maybe, uh, or you should be able to address their radiating arm pain, but now maybe they have severe activity related neck pain because you've actually made those very arthritic segments more arthritic because you've enabled more motion. Um, and honestly, I have some patients who say, fine, I want that. Um, I will take that chance of increased pain because I want the benefits of an artificial disc. And, and I have other patients who say, no, no, I, I want one spine surgery. And if that's a fusion, that's the one I want. And so it's all about the uniqueness of the patient. And I don't make square pegs fit in round holes. Um, and I try and tailor people's treatments to the patient, not to um, any new or sexy technology. I, I do like cervical artificial discs and have a lot of internal criteria that I use to who's really gonna benefit from one. Um, the lumbar artificial disc um, has not gained, gained widespread acceptance and the data across all surgeons has not honestly been that good. There are some centers who um, consistently put out papers that suggest that they are better than the industry thinks they are. But um, the difficulty in that literature is always deciding, are these just people who are really zealous about the procedure they do or whether they really do get good results or superior results to what else is available. And, and the problem in the low back is it's not it's not really the same problem as in the neck. It's, it's different in many ways. And so I find that um, while there are small numbers of patients probably would be ideal for a lumbar artificial disc, um, that number um, is, is not, e or those patients aren't easy to find. And um, I think sometimes we are trying to make the procedure fit the patient when, when they get an artificial disc. And, and I think that's why the um, procedure isn't um, doing nearly as well as the cervical artificial disc, unfortunately. I think that's still an unsolved problem in the low back. Great. The next question is, I have numbness in my foot that seems to be getting worse, more, um, I'm not sure what I'm sorry, I'm not reading it maybe quite right, but um, it seems to be getting worse. It's been going on for three to four years. Is this serious? <clears throat> it, it all likelihood, and again, um, back to the beginning of the talk, you know, it's been going on three to four years. In all likelihood, it's definitely, uh, in all likelihood, it's not serious. Um, yet, um, there's probably a reason for it. Um, and if it's distressing to the patient, then we're happy to look in on it and see, you know, does it have a reasonable explanation? Is it something um, that is, is different and maybe needs more um, attention and workup? Um, in general though, um, if it's just a small area of numbness, it's not troubling, not super painful to the patient um, and not associated with weakness of a muscle, I don't think there's um, tremendous harm in waiting. Um, I've had a numb great toe since um, I would, braced moguls uh, skiing as a teenager and it's never come back and it's probably not a spinal issue well I'm pretty sure it's not um, yet I have a numb toe and I've let it go and I'm a physician and maybe that's a bad example um, there's a couple questions about referrals um, and that that's all I have after that so if you do have a question you want to ask make sure to get it in but the one question, um, the first one was really talking about non-surgical interventions um, that I think you discussed earlier on. Um, do you refer out for those and what do you recommend or think is the most effective? Um, again, our goal when we see somebody and, and, and we almost always um, utilize all our multimodal options um, is um, 
our goal is to focus on those things because most people benefit from those more only. Um, so common referrals or um, options that we employ, and most of the time we'll oversee to make sure that it's, it's going like we anticipated are, um, like I said, physical therapy. We have an amazing crew at Barton, um, just really wonderful people who um, went into therapy for all the right reasons. So we send um, a good number of patients to them. Um, there are a, a lot of good regional chiropractors um, and, um, you know, I, I, for the um, fear of hurting anyone's feelings, I don't want to single any out, but there, there, there are some good ones in this community, um, as are acupuncturists. Um, and um, so those are typical places we might send people. Physiatry is another one that many patients aren't familiar with. Um, and Dr. Greg Burkhart um, is um, our primary physiatrist now. Allison Ganon, who's a good friend who will be leaving the practice soon. Um, and she's wonderful, but she'll be devoting her practice to the North Shore um, and Tahoe Forest. So, um, but Greg is a physician and he's trained in um, a discipline called physiatry or physical medicine and rehab, and he's excellent. He does all the non-surgical interventions like injections, epidural steroid injections, things called facet blocks or ablations, um, and some other more advanced things that occasionally are employed like spinal stimulators. Um, but um, he has a whole range of minimally invasive things that are good um, for not only treating, but also diagnosing problems. Um, I occasionally send patients to him for nerve conduction studies or EMGs to see if um, the health status of a nerve that I'm thinking about operating on. But um, that's a great resource and he's an excellent provider. Um, and I, um, uh, I, that's another entry point into spine care in our system. Um, another word on referrals is that obviously we're pleased to take care of um, other physician provider patients when they refer them to us. Um, but the truth is you don't need a referral in this system. Um, I'm happy to see anyone if they're self-referred and routinely do. Um, and um, that's one of the reasons why we kind of do these informational sessions is to make your decision a little more informed if you're going to decide to try and see us is that, you know, if you get episodic back pain once a year and it might get five out of 10 or it's really self-limited and it goes away and if you modify your activities and stay fit, things are going well, you probably don't need to see me. Um, yet, um, if it's worse than that, more concerning that, or you just have a high level of anxiety over it, then we're happy to see you and, and delve into whether it's a real issue or not. Um, but you do not have to um, seek out a provider in order to get a referral to see us. Okay. Well, I think you answered actually the second question and a couple others have come in. So um, if you have time, we'll ask a couple more. Oh, of course. Well, uh, one, one thing I'll tag on to that it's okay is that um, another common um, concern about the referral process is, you know, basically the way we arrange things is that, you know, people who are, who've graduated to a surgical referral, obviously they might have some priority in my clinic. Um, whereas the, the, everyone else who's referred um, really just goes to the next available slot, whether that's me or Dana Randall, and, and understand that at that stage of the game, there is absolutely no difference in who you're seeing, whether it's me or Dana, we're going to institute a lot of the same steps and use the same judgment to make sure that you're set up for what you might need. Um, and and um, I personally um, would be happy to see her first, um, to get the ball rolling and to get um, what's probably really going to help me right away. Um, whereas I know some patients will um, wonder like, well, geez, um, do I want to see his physician's assistant or him? Geez, I want to see him. And quite honestly, in our team, it's, it's not that way. 
um, you're getting equivalent care and your place in line or your um, stage of care is going to be equivalent no matter who you see, especially initially. Okay, um, there are a couple of questions I think related to personal um, experiences. So the first one is asking about numbness in both legs, below the knees, and both arms, below the elbows. Um, CIDP was the first guess by the neurologist, but um, the current neurologist disagrees. Will you be? Will you be maybe potentially seeing someone like that soon? Um, so. Um... Certainly, we get brought into the um, overall um, uh, care plan from neurology patients um, frequently. Um, and thankfully, while we've had some turnover in the system, we have a new neurologist who will be starting soon. Um, uh, so individual problems like that, I would um, stress, and um, we can't go into a ton on this, they should really be um, worked up um, individually because uh, it is common, very frequent, where I have patients who are sent to me for a problem or a diagnosis. And, uh, and I always make the point of first listening to the patient, examining the patient, then looking at images, then um, come up with a plan before I honestly even look at those referring diagnoses because um, what I don't want is um, to be misled. And frequently we are changing or altering diagnoses because um, we have different clinical judgment, um, especially when you get into these poly, uh, neuropathies, inflammatory demyelinating processes, et cetera. In general, some of these more metabolic conditions now being specific to the person's question, they are, um, they are really the domain of the neurologist. And neurologists um, who we work with frequently have a good knowledge on when they should see me. Um, so um, yet, of course, yeah, sometimes we are. Now I will say that very symmetrical bilateral problems that don't follow these normal nerve distributions often are these metabolic problems, but that's getting too specific and we'd rather just see you rather than miss you if, if that's a concern. But your neurologist is also usually um, a good resource for some of that stuff and know when to see you maybe, but um, I'm happy to regardless. Okay, and I'm gonna to try to generalize this last question, but it's asking about if there are non-surgical alternatives for a paracentral disc bulge. 100%, um, so paracentral disc bulges are the most common disc bulges. Um, and there's some good anatomic reasons for that. But um, the long and short of it is um, we always institute good conservative care for those problems and surgery is still, even for big disc herniations, the option of last resort. Um, there's some good data that we rely on. Um, there's a whole lot of data with regards to treating um, disc herniations conservatively. Um, if I condense some big high-level studies, what I would say is that 60% um, of them um, generally get by without surgery. Um, and who might benefit from earlier surgery rather than later, i.e. earlier referral um, from your primary care or other type of doctor who's managing that um, disc herniation um, are young, active, employed people because um, when you look at that group of patients, they, um, they tend to get the most out of a surgery, i.e. return to work, return to function, return to sport. Um, and have more to lose by holding them out of those things. Whereas um, other patients um, and even some of those, again, treated as individuals really deserve um, to have a tincture of time, good conservative care, because some of those problems will just resolve. Some of those discs will actually shrink up. Um, and um, again, going back to some of those red flags, if that disc herniation is associated with weakness, loss of bowel or bladder function, that's not, um, that's not normal. That has to, to move forward. 
Wonderful. Well, I think that concludes all the questions. Um, I appreciate everyone being here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Child. I'll just remind folks that um, you can review this entire webinar on our YouTube page or our Facebook page if you'd like to come back to it. Um, and I know Dr. Child is available for questions. If you think of something um, after the fact, you can always email that to me. Um, and there will be a quick survey that's sent out at the conclusion of tonight's webinar. We'd love your feedback. Let us know how we're doing and what future topics you'd like to hear. So with that, I will say good night and thank you again, Dr. Child, for being here. Thank you, everybody.